It's day 543 of growing pomegranate trees from seeds. There are five new offshoots to compensate for the main stems imbalance. At least that's what I'm thinking because they're all growing on the top side. And if they were to get long enough and grow in the other direction, hopefully they could pull the main stem upright into a perpendicular position to the soil. It's uh, Maybe it's wishful thinking, but it'll at least provide some bit of counterweight to all the existing foliage that's pulling it in one direction. So I have this pot facing the sun and you can see how badly these things are drooping. They're heavy with very, uh, I wouldn't say big leaves, but they are um, maybe kind of big for pomegranates. So the foliage mostly looks healthy. There are some signs of powdery mildew or some other kind of maybe fungal infection on the older foliage as you can see from that um, low-lying offshoot that can barely stand up on its own. So uh, a few days later you could see there's a lot more development with those new offshoots. The foliage is sort of a yellowish green in the beginning as always and it looks uh, pretty healthy. I would say there are some signs of ruffling on the edges of the leaves. So I think um, other than that, you know, I can't really complain that much about the way this thing is growing lately other than its inability to stand up straight. You can see the strain that's caused by the stem being pulled in one direction. It's day 554 and you can see uh, the offshoots are getting longer but at this rate it's going to take a long time before they can provide any sort of counterweight if they even choose to grow in the other direction. They look like they might lean in the same direction towards the sun anyway. And this really low-lying offshoot is perhaps something I should have cut off a long time ago. And you can see there's another offshoot coming from beneath the soil line, the very base of the stem, and also some little potential shoots coming out of the sides of the main stem as well. So on day 555, I decided to do a transplant from my current 75% sand 25% filter clay soil mixture to something that's uh, virtually all sand, a very, very sandy loam, 90 plus percent um, sand. And I'm doing this in hopes of making a mixture that's more breathable for the roots, that will get more oxygen to the roots so they can um, become more robust. Because as you can see, the root ball seems to be sort of flimsy. These roots are very fragile and they break off to the slightest touch. So this root ball is very disappointing in size and thickness, but I completely expected that because why else would this plant be drooping over all the time? So as you can see, it's, um, it's broken off at the ends, but it'll do fine. It'll regenerate. And I really should have soaked this, uh, entire plant's root system in water or in wet sand as I was doing this prep work. I didn't take a very long time for this prep work, but regardless, it seems to have dried out as the minutes pass by. So I'm basically diluting this existing mixture with a plain sand, quick reap play sand that I get from Lowe's. And I'm making um, something that's closer to 90% sand. So as I mentioned, I should have kept this wet. Um, or maybe it wouldn't have made a difference. I'll show you in the later footage uh, what I mean by that. So there's a little offshoot that I just pointed to a few clips ago and that's already all dried up and looks to be in really bad shape in just a few minutes. So this plant is a very sick patient. It needs um, some kind of like development of its root system otherwise it's never going to take off and as you can see just after uh, you know tens of minutes with its root system exposed and a few roots broken off it looks to be in pretty bad shape already so uh, you always want the root system to be more robust than the shoot system this plant is the opposite it has virtually no roots and it's all shoots so I don't know if that's just native to how this plant performs intrinsically or is this um, 
just due to the conditions I raised it in. So if you have experience growing pomegranate trees and you don't have any of these problems, uh, please let me know in the comments. But you can see just from this watering that the whole thing's fallen over again. I can try to write it, but unless the root system um, gets its act together and grows strong, then pretty much nothing I do in terms of uh, exogenous structural support is going to help it in the long run. So on day 557, you can see all the beautiful newer leaves are still there, but they're drooping downwards. And uh, the branches, uh, if you can even call them that, they're more like really, really fine twigs that grow too long and not thick enough. They're all curling all over the place and drooping due to the dehydration they suffered from the transplant. And it's uh, quite shocking how much damage was incurred just from that transplant and the roots being out in the air for a few minutes. So on day 561, you can see the foliage is getting all yellow. So I'm going to lose all these leaves, basically. I'm going to let the leaves stay on. I'm not going to clip them off. My guess is that within two weeks, all of them will be shed naturally anyway. I'm just going to leave them on so if the plant so chooses, it may recycle the nutrients from them. Although I'm not even sure that there's enough time for that. You can see a lot of these leaves here that have been shed. They don't look like they've been properly recycled of nutrients. It looks like the plant's shedding all its leaves to conserve water because there's too much transpiration from these hundreds of leaves and the root system can't get water fast enough into the shoot system even though as you can see uh, every week I'm flood watering this thing with uh, probably something close to a gallon and I'm providing nutrients so it's just that the root system is so underdeveloped and now damaged that it can't get any of that to the shoot system. So this thing is a real blight on my balcony. It just looks really, really ugly right now. And these branches aren't straightening up either, even uh, having lost all this leaf weight and water weight in the leaves. So I might do some pruning to try to get this thing to have a better refresh and grow more upright but yeah these are the last few leaves and even these uh, new leaves on these offshoots the five offshoots or more that came off of the other side of the stem the main stem they're all looking bruised and battered too so I'm pruning this to make it more upright hopefully in the future and I've shortened all these stems this will also help to conserve water and lessen the stress on the plant as it recovers and this thing is pretty much staying perpendicular although I wouldn't push my luck and push it too far in any one direction I'm trying to get it so that it, it'll be balanced and perpendicular in the future so on day 571 um, I made uh, one tablespoon sugar per gallon water solution that I'm gonna put it into this spray bottle labeled sucrose so the reason I'm preparing sugar water is because I'm going to pour it into this spray bottle labeled sucrose and use it to spray my plant leaves. Um, at first I tried it on some of my plants and then, especially for this one, I decided, well, I have nothing to lose. It looks like it's mostly dying anyway and having a hard time recovering. Maybe this could be just the thing that it needs to recover. So the logic behind spraying sugar water on plant leaves to get them to grow faster is that the sugar can enter the stomata, the little holes on the backs of plant leaves, the undersides that the plant uses to breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen, etc. Uh, for gaseous exchange, uh, things can be absorbed directly through those little holes. That's the principle behind foliar feeding, which um, there are certain fertilizers that cater to that. They can just be sprayed on the plant leaves and be absorbed more directly rather than just letting all that stuff soak into the soil and um, only a fraction of that will be taken up by the plant so I had to do a dilution after I made that initial um, dilution so to get it to the one tablespoon per gallon concentration that they recommend it seems pretty light to me but 
If there's anything that can make my plants grow faster, especially things like the Joshua tree, I'm all for trying that. And that's why I'm doing this experiment, although there is a bit of risk. Um, I imagine this will be a sticky, disgusting mess, and it might attract a lot of bugs and cause uh, mold rot or other things. So um, a few days later, I decided to give it a try. So my regimen was basically to spray sugar water on my plant leaves um, every other day. And I noticed there was a lot of residue, so I would use distilled water in a spray bottle to spread my plants on the days off to try to reactivate the sugar water by dissolving what was already caked all over the plant leaves. You can see there's a powdery mildew problem on the leaves that were remaining. Not only that, but they're really yellowed and burned. To delve further into how this should work on paper in plants, sucrose is the major transport form for photoassimilated carbon and is a source of carbon skeletons and energy for plant organs unable to perform photosynthesis, also known as sink organs. So the biggest example I can think of is the root system. It never sees sunlight. It doesn't have chloroplasts anyway. Uh, unless it's exposed to light, then it can turn green. But everything such as the structures covered in bark, the stems, the trunk, the root system, those are the plant organs that cannot perform photosynthesis and can't make their own energy. The leaves make their own energy through photosynthesis. And I should add that there's a caveat in the case of some succulents the trunk can photosynthesize or desert plants. Um, but in this case, it's just the leaves um, taking water from the ground and carbon dioxide from the air to make various sugars. So plants and animals have all these different sugars that they use as energy currencies and for us, uh, we have sugar in our bloodstream for plants. They can pass it through all of these different membranes within the plant. So sucrose is made of glucose and fructose. It's a molecule translocated over distances in the plant and it has to pass through a number of membranes. So it's something that's freely permeable either actively or passively throughout all of the plant tissues. So if you can get that to go in through the stomata, the little gaseous exchange holes and the undersides of plant leaves, then on, at least on paper, it should um, be used as energy to uh, promote growth throughout the entire plant. So the idea is very powerful. However, after about a week or so, I decided to discontinue the experiment because I really didn't see the effect that I was hoping for or that it was claimed on the internet. So um, the other thing was like a few weeks later, I was interested in pursuing this a little further. So I took the same concentration of sugar, one tablespoon per gallon. They always say not to use more because you're gonna burn the leaves. And most people actually try this sugar water method. They just pour the sugar water directly into the soil, which I think is a really bad idea and not everyone adheres to the concentration of one tablespoon of sucrose per gallon of water. And I've seen testimonials of people who have poured it directly into the soil and killed their plants, probably because they used too high of a concentration or because that sugar was just used by microbes and that used up all the oxygen in the soil caused root rot or the microbes themselves released toxic uh, byproducts, waste gases that destroy the roots. They could also attack the roots directly if they're in great numbers. So there are a variety of reasons why I think the, the foliar method makes sense over the watering directly method. And um, yeah, just pouring into the soil, I think that uh, has the potential for disaster. If you lose the leaves, your plant can always restart. But if you lose the root system, your plant is uh, immediately dead. It's just over. I mean, the root system can die in many cases and the shoot system can hold up appearances for even months. I had that for my very first mango series, but in actuality, that's just because some plants have really tough leaves like the mango and the roots are actually long dead. So you're just wasting your time. 
So speaking of the mango and this whole sugar water thing, I decided to pursue this a little further a few weeks later. So I tried this experiment where I took the exact same concentration of sugar water, one tablespoon per gallon, filled up a plastic container and soaked many of the low-lying leaves into this container full of sugar water. And for up to 48 hours, I was actually worried that the plant leaves would drown the mango leaves. So the reason I chose the mango was because that plant hasn't gone anywhere for so many months. And I will eventually release an update on it. I don't want to give away any spoilers, but um, at least for this experiment, as it pertains to um, sugar water getting into plants, um, if you soak leaves, big broad leaves directly in for 48 hours and nothing happens, then nothing ever will. So I concluded that sugar water can't be absorbed through the stomata um, like foliar fertilizing can. So what I'm doing now is I'm basically pruning away a lot of these sickly looking branches. Um, I'm continuing my pruning process of trying to get this to grow upright. The plant just refuses to cooperate. So even though it's recovered to a decent degree so far and it's not falling over yet, it just seems like I haven't solved this problem and so because of that I'm thinking about many other ways in which I can deal with this problem. So I'm very reluctant to stick a stake into my plants on my pots and try to get it to work like that uh, and to have to tie everything down but I might have to do something like that. So it's day 604 I'm using my old lux meter to estimate how much light my plants are getting. So as I mentioned earlier in this video and other videos uh, this balcony and this new place I've moved to doesn't receive sunlight for I don't know maybe it's probably like half of the year or something. So this plant receives roughly in the low 4000s lux. That's what it gets uh, in the absence of direct sunlight. And on day 610, so by mid to late August, the sun started shining on my balcony directly. Finally, the intensity of the sun, if it's direct sun, can be up to 120,000 lux. So just receiving 4000, that's like 1 30th of that. So on day 618, there was a blistering heat wave that struck Southern California. It was 103 Fahrenheit, 39 Celsius at 10 a.m. in the morning. And you can hear the sound of leaves falling from the trees and wood cracking. Some of that wood might be on the building as well. A few hours later, the high temperature of the day was 109 to 111 Fahrenheit, around 43 Celsius. So everything aside from my Joshua tree was in mortal danger. I moved all of my plants out of the direct blast zone of the sun, especially for my jackfruit series that had just begun. Uh, so a lot of these series might have ended if I hadn't taken action on that day. So this is Spectracide Immunox. The chemical active ingredient is Myclobutanil. It's 1.55%. So I've had a severe powdery mildew infection, as you may have noticed for most of this episode. It just won't go away. And this is a compound that's intended for application to fruit trees, uh, which is great because that's mostly what I grow for this YouTube channel. And I got a cheapo Target spray bottle just so uh, I wouldn't have to put these chemicals in some of the other things um, that I use for just like hydrogen peroxide or or uh, alcohols or distilled water things like that so just to test this compound out i'm spraying um i know the foliage in the front the new stuff that's all lighter green that should be fine but um yeah it says to spray the entire plant so then i spun the whole pot around and i sprayed all of the undersides and i coated the entire plant basically so it said that once this stuff dries it won't wash off in the rain in my case I never get rain here onto this balcony unless there were a severe storm with wind but that hasn't happened yet um, so things get really dusty over time it's really just me spraying tap water or distilled water to wash off the leaves periodically keep up appearances for all of my uh, videography for these plant growing series so hopefully that'll do something. 
And on day 625, I used a thick metal wire to corral this unruly structureless mess that's been a real uh, thorn in my side just because every time it just falls over to one side, but it's not tall enough to just fling over the balcony rail. And as you can see, I don't expect the powdery mildew to uh, go away in appearance on those leaves. They're just full of fruiting bodies or whatever. I might eventually just trim all that stuff away, but for now, I think those leaves can still photosynthesize. I think with a spectricide, if it works, it could definitely just stop that from spreading and growing. And there's been a lot of new growth, and it, it looks to be pretty healthy, so I don't think um, that's going to be a problem going forward. It may turn out that this um, powdery mildew has been the main source of my woes, and Maybe with enough healthy growth that lasts long enough without getting infected with more powdery mildew, the plant will finally have enough energy to grow a more robust root system and thicker stems. So we'll just have to wait and see. As of now, um, this would be an unruly mess without the wire, but with the wire, it looks better. And that's kind of unsightly, but it's at least way better than just looking at everything flopping over. So on day 631, you can see there's been a lot more growth. There's new growth from the bottom. It's unstoppable, and as many people have noted with many plants, if you prune them more and more, then they're just going to have more offshoots, which is exactly what inadvertently happened with this plant. So um, I can still tell that these are very um, over-elongated, very thin, fine, branches that sort of curve in seemingly nonsensical directions uh, yeah without this wire it would be a huge mess but um, maybe with me guiding the the growth the positioning of the branches every few weeks and readjusting this wire every few weeks um, I can get a result that's somewhat satisfactory so I've basically given up on the whole pruning to try to get the desired uh, morphology overall of this plant because that's not going to work. All I'm doing or all I was doing was uh, slowing down the growth by cutting away all that nice new foliage. So um, yeah, I noticed some people love to prune repeatedly and um, just keep chopping away. I'm actually the opposite, although you've seen me do a lot of pruning in this very episode. I typically only do that as a last resort with all my other plants. I just let them grow straight up. I believe that's the better way. I don't like the idea of pruning, unnecessary pruning, when a plant reaches a certain height or age just because it's a certain height or age. It doesn't make any sense to me. It seems like you're just wasting a lot of nutrients and development time. You're retarding the growth of your plant by several weeks by chopping off that shoot apical marrow stem um, to get something that's like a foot tall to be more bushy, you know, I think that's that's pretty optional and counterproductive. So um, it's day 639, and you can see after the spectricide Michelobutano uh, application, uh, things have really been looking up. I don't see powdery mildew on any of the new leaves. There's a lot more of these leaves. They're they're uh, nice and shiny, waxy. They're not as, well, they still are kind of ruffled at the edges. I think that's just a feature of the leaves. But there's um, a minimum, at least, of that powdery mildew. I did just see one leaf there. It's in the lower right-hand corner. I don't know how old that leaf is, but eventually I could just prune away the leaves that still have all those mildewy uh, fruiting bodies on them just for aesthetics but in the meantime I think this plant is fine I could try applying that microbutanol again at some point if I think it's uh, continuing to be a problem but I think the problem has been solved for now and the watering the fertilization that's been very consistent throughout the several months in which I'm presenting in this video episode so really the only difference was the fungicide and the metal wire to give it some structure externally so it helps to keep the position the wire does and 
I hope the root system starts to get a little thicker. The stem is definitely thicker at this point and the offshoots look a little thicker, but it's still the same general problem. And I don't think there's any specialized advice out there on how to only grow the stems and the roots and not the leaves. So I've had a lot of great leaf growth for most of this year in 2020. And um, it seems like the leaves outgrow the stems and the, the roots often for some of my plants. But um, I don't know how to balance that out, but at least growth for the most part has been coming pretty easily in 2020 and this plant has regenerated very quickly after fungicide application so maybe that was my problem all along so please stay tuned to my youtube channel for further updates on my pomegranate and other plants thanks for watching